I started learning Power BI in late 2016 and since then I have done a lot of Power BI. I post data, Excel and Power BI content on major social channels. I run a consulting company that helps other organizations implement Power BI effectively in their own organization. I also teach the practical applications of Power BI to several employees of such companies and I also tend to speak at international conferences about again Excel and Power BI. And through these years of experience of teaching, consulting and solving problems on Power BI, if I had to start all over again and teach myself Power BI once again in let's say 2025 just about to come here is how I would do it all over again the very first thing that I would try to put in order is the mindset shift what do I mean by that? I would start learning how to make models and not dashboards. You see that the end product of any particular Power BI report is a dashboard or a chart. That's what everybody sees when they are taking a look at the end product, maybe a visualization, a chart, dashboard, whatever that might be. But beneath this, there is a big layer of architecture. There is modeling, there is DAX, there's Power Query work, there are connections. All of that is supporting that little visualization or report or dashboard that you're seeing. I would not compromise learning a modeling first then learning visualizations first over the course of many many consulting projects and many many mistakes that I can't even just count on my fingers I have learned that modeling is the main part of developing any successful Power BI report. If your model is designed well, everything that follows the model, which is visualizations, DAX, calculations, all of that eventually becomes very, very simple to do. Now, a lot of you might be viewing this video for the first time and you may not understand what do I mean by modeling and why do I put so much importance on that? So let's just take a look at a particular example. Let's just say that you're working with some sales data and that belongs to any particular year. Consider that that belongs to 2023. Now you load that data in Power BI, create a few your calculations maybe the total sales calculation and you're kind of good to go then 2024 comes along and you load another data as a separate table in power bi for whatever reasons now you have two different tables one is for 2023 and the other table sales table is for 2024 now let's say that you're trying to show a calculation which is growth over last year how much have you grown in 2024 as compared to 2023 if let's say you loaded two different tables in your model which is a table for 2023 and a separate table for 2024. In this case, the calculation is going to become complex and not even dynamic. So you would write a calculation for the sales of 2023 and you would write a calculation for calculating the sales of 2024. And then if I ask you to find growth over last year, you're obviously going to write growth over last year calculation, 2024 divided by 2023 sales minus one, and that is going to be your answer. But what's going to happen when 2025 data kicks in? Now. If you continue the pattern of adding another table of 2025, then you will have to create one more growth over last year calculation. And then the same story repeats for 2026 and 2027 and so on and so forth. Now, ideally speaking, if you had thought about how to structure the data and you could have pulled all the years of sales data into one single table, then the growth over last year calculation would not only be easy, but also dynamic. That means you can write one growth over last year calculation and use it for as many years of data as you would have. And this is what I mean to say by modeling. So this was a very simple example, but when you deal with more complicated case studies, more complicated data sets, this becomes absolutely imperative for you to pay attention to even before you start creating any visualization. This is the first and the foremost thing that I would teach myself how to build great models in Power BI. All right, if you're enjoying the video thus far, you're absolutely going to love my courses on Power BI. DAX, Data Modeling, Power Query, and the M language. These are more advanced courses. Although they start from the basics, we start from scratch and we build up your fundamentals. And then you will have the ability of understanding the logic. And then you can take that logic and even apply it to your own problems. I talk about no jargons, give you a lot of examples in the courses. And hundreds and hundreds of students have signed up for these courses and they have found it immensely beneficial. In case you're looking forward to level up your Power BI journey, I'd highly recommend that you take a look at the courses. They're going to be super helpful. The link for the courses is down in the description. Let's go. The next very, very important and big thing that I have learned over the years and many consulting projects is that now I should always prefer insights 
over design. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's just say that you are handed off a particular project and the end goal is to make a report, maybe a sales report. Once you're given this task, if the very first few things that come to your mind is that how am I going to decorate or how am I going to beautify or how am I going to show my numbers, you are actually doomed. Let me show you how. Consider a total sales card visualizations and the first few things that you think about those card visualization is that, hey, should I put a shadow or not? Should I maybe do, do a border or not? How do I beautify this? What color should I put it on? What font would look nice? All of these questions are obviously going to format that particular card visualization, but the number, which is sales, is going to be isolated and the number would not provide any other insight. The CEO or anybody who's looking a look at this particular report is still going to see that very number, no matter how beautiful that number looks. The color and the formatting of the number is not going to run the company. What is going to run the company is additional insights that are going to prove valuable alongside total sales. Now consider another approach where I am not thinking about the design first and I'm thinking about insights first. The same card visualization, which is total sales, if I pair last year number along with that, then I can show relative growth as compared to the last year. If I also pair, let's say, the total trends of the months in which the sales was really high or really low as compared to the last year, that is going to provide even further insight on top of that. Now, if I were to just think about the sales number in isolation, the design, the decoration of that number, obviously I would not pay as much attention to the insights. Once you have gathered all the insights that are going to be valuable for the end user to take a look at then it's the time to take a look at those insights and then start building some design to be able to show it better so think about insights first and then design after that now that we're speaking about design and the next big learning is about design that i have learned over these years is nothing but the crap principle. You see that once you're creating a dashboard or a report, there are four key things that you have to keep in mind. The first one, according to the crap principle, is the C, which is nothing but contrast. What do I mean by contrast? Contrast simply means the ability to highlight the relevant stuff that you'd like to show it as a different thing. Now, contrast could mean a different size of the font. Making something bigger is going to have more contrast on that. Could be a different font, could be a bold. These are all the methods that you can use to highlight any particular value. And it's a good idea that you might want to pay attention to what do you want to highlight and then that is nothing but your contrasting element on the dashboard. So you can use contrast very effectively to present your data in a more meaningful manner, especially where you want the user's attention to be driven, and that's where you put more contrast on. The next thing in the crap principle is the R or repetition. Now repetition is extremely important when it comes to consistency of doing the same fonts over and over again. Don't try to change the colors, don't try to change the fonts. If you repeat the same formatting style over and over again throughout different font styles, font colors, chart axes, and all of that, your dashboard starts to look cohesive and very, very consistent. That's another good practice that I have learned to follow over these years. The next thing that I have learned about the crap principle is the A or the alignment, which makes a very, very big difference to how your dashboard looks like. If the dashboard is not perfectly aligned, the top alignment is not perfect or the horizontal distance is not perfect, your dashboard is going to somehow look unorderly. So once you've created a dashboard, please make sure that the visual alignment of all the objects of the dashboard is perfectly aligned. The margins are aligned, the distribution between the objects is aligned, vertical distribution, horizontal distribution, and all of those small little things. Just aligning your dashboard is going to give a whole new orderly feeling of the dashboard and your dashboard will start to look a lot better designed as compared to an unaligned dashboard. And the final thing in the crap principle is the P, which is nothing but proximity. What do I mean by proximity? A lot of times you're going to see that we have buttons, we have slicers, and those slicers do not really interact with the entire dashboard. They are perhaps made for one particular visualizations. Or you are going to see titles that do not really title the entire layer of charts. They're going to be a title for one particular element in the dashboard. Now, if your uh, slicers or your charts or your titles are kept all over the place, then the user would not understand that this particular slicer is going to interact with this particular chart and has got nothing to do with the other parts of the dashboard. And this principle is the proximity principle. 
things that relate to one another, they should be kept proximate or close to one another. This could also apply to labels underneath the chart. So let's just say that if your chart is pre presenting the data in millions or thousands, and if this only applies to one particular chart, you make sure that that label is underneath that chart and is proximate to that so that the visual understanding of the chart is clear enough that this identification, label, chart, slicer, whatever that is, belongs to this chart. This is super important. You can't expect the user to automatically understand that the slicer on the top right corner of the dashboard belongs to the left bottom chart of the dashboard. That's not gonna work. My last learning, and that's a very, very big and insightful learning, which is prefer people over Power BI. I see that you're actually working with Power BI and Power BI is just merely a tool to get things done. It's people who are working in organizations doing the groundwork and that work is collecting the data, which is then fed into Power BI, which is then converted into insights, reports or dashboard and then consumed by people. And you're often going to come across necessities or requirements which are off the hook and people are going to ask you to do absurd things in Power BI that to you perhaps would not make any sense. I will highly recommend that you prefer the needs of people over the capabilities of the tool. The tool is actually made for people and people are not made for the tool. Please remember that. If you were to go and stretch beyond the capabilities of the tool, you'll not only see that how much could you stretch and even come up with very, very innovative solutions, but if you do come up with solutions to those problems, no matter with Power BI or outside Power BI, you'll have very, very creative stories to tell in another interview, in another position, that how did you solve a very tricky nature of the problem because you put people first more than the software first. And obviously you don't perpetually want to be known as a Power BI guy because today we have Power BI, tomorrow there could be some other tool and after that there could be some other tool and things like that. What you generally would want to be known as a problem solver more than just a Power BI or a DAX expert or whatever that might be. That's a much better and solid foundation to build rather than just being hellbent on what the tool can do and you focusing on the very tool itself. If you've enjoyed this video and you'd like to take your journey to the next level and start learning Power BI from scratch, I will highly recommend that you watch another structured video, which is where I talk about the strategies to start learning Power BI right from scratch. You can find the video right here. Mm -hmm.